Well, thank you very much, Victor. Just excuse me a minute, I'm going to get some water. Um, I just want to start by saying that one of the reasons I wrote about these women is that they, and their male agents, I don't want to think that the, you to think the male agents weren't as brave, but they, they, they set an example of moral courage which is as important today as it was when they were fighting over 70 years ago when they were working undercover against the Nazis for the Special Operations Executive, an organization which was set up at Churchill's command, he famously said, set Europe ablaze. And they began to find people who could speak f uh, the, any of the languages of Europe, but especially French, uh, to be trained as undercover operatives to go into, into France, which had become a sort of black hole after the Nazis occupied it. And they looked for university types, they looked for bankers, they looked for lawyers, they looked for military men, but they also looked for Trotskyites, communists, Stalinists, anarchists, burglars, pimps, anybody that they thought might have a skill that they could use. And they, and they began to look at what had up to that point been called terrorist organizations like the IRA to see how they had disrupted the British and to see whether they could use the same techniques to disrupt the Nazis and to, to, and to disrupt the Germans. And it was a very male establishment organization. It was run, and, and I'll explain why a bit later on, it was run by, on the whole, men, and men sort of thought that w women were fine so long as they did typing and d did the cooking and looked after them. But they were, obviously weren't people who could be sent into action. They weren't people who could use guns and organize explosives and, and spy undercover. And then the man who was recruiting uh, the agents, um, a man called Selwyn Jepson, he came to the conclusion very quickly that women would be better at the job. And the people he was working for said, oh, no, 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 we don't want women. We absolutely don't want women. So Selwyn, it's a silly idea. And Selwyn got very, very uh, taxed by this. And so he went to see the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, and he said, look, he said, Prime Minister, I think that the women have a, a cool and lonely courage, which is where I got the title of my book from, which would make them better at this job than men. They're, they're better at working on their own. And the Prime Minister looked at him, and we know this because he tells us what happened, and said, yes, I agree. And as soon as Winston Churchill had said that, Jepson had his imprimatur to find women, and he set about finding them. And there were two women who had already penetrated the special services, I mean, the, um, the underground services. One was called Christine Scarbeck, and the other was a woman called uh, Virginia Hall. Christine Scarbeck was a Pole. She was a countess. She was very brave. She was a beauty queen. She rode horses. She was, um, you, you know, she loved skiing. She was a champion skier. And somebody who knew her said uh, that she was the most intrepid human being he'd ever met, man or woman. And Christine heard about the fall of Poland when she was, on, she, was, she was on a cruise with her first husband. And you can't believe how v uh, sort of vicious the Germans were when they went into Poland. Hitler had told them, close your hearts to pity, be harsh, be remorseless. And the ch soldiers chalked on the sides of the carriages that were taking them to Poland, we're going to Poland to thrash the Jews. Uh, so, you know, and they wanted to wipe out the... Um, the Polish middle classes, and Christine, Christine heard about this. She went straight to London. She was very good at wangling things. She got herself straight to the top. She was interviewed, and the man who interviewed her was absolutely smitten by her, as, as almost every other man who met her became smitten by her. And he said, I've, we've got a prize here. We've got, to, um, we've got to engage her immediately. And they said, OK, we'll engage her immediately. And, and she said, what I want to do is go into Poland I will infiltrate myself into Poland, which, which had also become a black hole. Nobody knew what was going on inside there. And they said, what you've got to do is distribute propaganda and collect intelligence. And Christine said, right. And they sent her, first of all, to Budapest in Hungary to find a guide to take her in the winter over the Tatra Mountains. Uh, and, the, and the first met person that she met of any use was an old boyfriend, a brave tall, fair-haired man with blue eyes, who was the holder of the Vitertu Militari, which is the Hungarian version of the Victoria Cross. And he said to Christine, he said, look, it's the winter, 
<coughs> the Tatra Mountains are very difficult. You're a woman. You'll never make it. And of course, he'd been an old boyfriend. She said, right, we'll go and have dinner. They went and have din had dinner. And being Christine, they ended up in her flat in Budapest. And he found it all very warm and cozy. And that night, they became lovers. And when the maid called in the morning, the, the guy had to hide in the cupboard so as not to be discovered. But he then agreed that, that Christina could, he'd find somebody to help her get across the mountains. Um, one of the things that Christina, I mean, that's an example of how she could derange people. One man who she spurned uh, was, was so in love with her. He said, if you don't let me be your boyfriend, I'm going to castrate myself with my revolver. And he tried to do that, but he managed to shoot himself in the foot instead. And then, and then later on, he tried to drown himself by jumping in the Danube. And he'd forgotten that it was winter, that it was frozen. So all he did was break both his ankles. But that was the sort of effect she had on people. Um, and they eventually they found a, uh, an Olympic, um, another Olympic skier who agreed to help her over the mountains. And they went over the mountains and, of course, being Christina, by the time they got over the mountains to Warsaw, they were lovers. I mean, nobody could resist Christina, and if she wanted you, she'd, she'd get you. And there she was. She wasn't trusted because the Poles felt that the British had betrayed them and that she was working for British intelligence. But she did manage very quickly to um, establish a radio station run by a journalist. She, she traveled all over Poland. This is Nazi-occupied German where they, they were out to get them. She traveled by, by um, foot, by train where she could, by, you know, by horse drawn, any, any vehicle that she could get hold of, she would. She tried to set up an organization to resist the Russians. And for some reason, somebody in um, London said, no, wrote on her report, no, not this, by no, not, not this, not at all. They didn't want her to fight the Russians. But she did manage to get hold of a secret anti-tank gun that the uh, the Poles had been using very effectively as, as they were overwhelmed by the Nazis. And she got it, she sawed the barrel off, she sawed the stock off, and she took the, mechani the firing mechanism out of Poland. And, and her, her, um, that, that's a very quick compression of what she did. Um, her, her mission was so successful uh, that, that when she was taken out, somebody, the, the, the British ambassador in Budapest said, who smuggled her out of Budapest in the end by, in the boot of a car, said Christine can do anything with dynamite except eat it. And that's, that's the sort of um, the w woman she was. Virginia Hall had worked for the American Diplomatic Service and had wanted to be a diplomat, but she, earlier in her life, about 10 years before the war, she, had, she was 30, she had managed to shoot herself in the foot on a hunting expedition and had lost her leg. And she wore a wooden leg or a false leg called Cuthbert um, and she did manage to get enrolled in the, um, in the underground services. And, and there was a moment when she was trying to get across some mountains and the leg was hurting her. And she ra radioed, I'm having a great deal of trouble with Cuthbert. And the um, authorities radioed back, then shoot him if, if necessary. They, they hadn't taken on board that her leg was called Cuthbert. But she uh, infilt was infiltrated. She, she first of all um, met a man called Nicholas Boddington. And remember, she's American, so the Americans aren't at war with the, with the Germans. And, and, and if she could find a reason to be in France, she could move around comparatively easily. And she met a man called Nicholas Boddington, who was the second in command of the SOE. And in a minute, I'll tell you how the SOE was run. And he said, this is really good. He was known as a complete shit. Everybody hated him. But he said, I've met this woman called... Um, uh, Christine Granville, we should enroll her, we should put her, what they call put her through the cards, which means just check her out. They, they'd sent her to be trained. She confused her instructors because she dressed, she was wearing a uniform, which was very sort of um, ordinary khaki uniform, and she looked quite masculine, and they, nobody could really work out whether she was a man or a woman. And she realized how important and how dangerous her business was when they were taught to do unarmed combat, and they were taught, first of all, with, with real knives, but eventually they had to fight men in, in the training. And so she put a lot of lipstick on her wooden dagger and crept up on this bloke and, and slashed his throat with it. And when she saw her lipstick right across his throat, she realized that this, was, um, this is the real thing. And, 
it, it, the, the New York Post agreed to hire her as a journalist in France. That was her reason for being in France. She went to Lyon. She was. <coughs> Uh, she immediately went to the Germans, said, hello, I'm, I'm an American journalist, I'm here to report on what it's like. And she did write genuine reports to, uh, uh, which were printed in the New York Post about what it was like. At the same time, she tried to make contact with, with French potential agents. Uh, she met an English pilot who'd been incredibly, very badly burned, and he was waiting to be repatriated. He'd lost all his fingers, he'd lost a lot of his face. But he knew the people of Lyon. He said, look, for God's sake, he said, this is a very unfriendly town. Don't trust anybody. I will guide you to people who you, who you can use. And he led her to um, people who ran the railways, people who were in the post office. And one of his most important um, contacts was the Madame of a brothel. And she had German officers coming to use her women's services. They would indulge it. They were lonely. They would, go, they would tell the prostitutes how lonely they were. The prostitutes would tell the madame, the madame would tell Virginia, and that would all add up to a big picture of what was going on. Intelligence is a question of, of uh, collecting small amounts of data and getting them together, and they make the big picture. No single agent really has the big picture, but those people back at home do. And somebody said, if you go into Christine's uh, into um, Virginia's kitchen, you'll meet every major uh, agent in, in France. And as I say, she was walking around uh, comparatively freely, uh, and, and she managed to do this for about two and a half years. And then the Germans went into what was called the unoccupied zone, which was the southern part of France. And Klaus Barbie, who was, became known as the Butcher of Lyon, uh, uh, an SS officer, a particularly vicious, said, get the American bitch, I want her, and there was something like a million francs on her head, but by that time she'd gone, she escaped by the skin of her teeth. She was being run from London by a small office known as F Section that was, that was organized by three people. One was a, a man called May, uh, Colonel Morris Buckmaster, and Buckmaster had been a, uh, a man working for the Ford Motor Company in France. He was an amiable amateur who didn't know what he was, he was doing. And, I, and I'm going to tell you some stories about him which will show you how amiable and amateur and dangerous he was to his agents. His second in command was a man called Nicholas Boddington who'd had been in contact with the Gestapo before the war. Uh, Buckmaster trusted him implicitly and he was, we think, he was a very, very dodgy, um, dodgy character who ca carried, possibly carried on with his contacts with the, with the Nazis. And the third one, person was a woman called Vera Atkins, who w was f extraordinarily, it, she was working in one of the most secret organizations in, in Europe, certainly in England and in the Northern Hemisphere. She was not naturalized. She had access to a lot of highly secret information and it has been argued she was um Hunger she was Romanian and it has been argued that she was a triple agent working for the Russians and if you think at the same time that the, Ru that the Russians had other agents like Burgess and McLean working for them and one of them one of those men worked for a while for the SOE it's not unlikely could never be proved because all the papers pertaining to, the, to um, Vera's work have disappeared and she was very secretive and kept things in her head. Um, so you've got an amateur, a Romanian, and a man who's despised running this organization. Um, in France, against them, was at the, at the beginning of the war, uh, there was a woman called Mathilde Carré, who became known as the Cat. And Mathilde was a very brave French woman who thought she said, at one point she reported that there was nothing like being under, under aerial bombardment because it made you feel more alive. And for a while she worked with a, with a Hungarian, well, no, with a Polish uh, officer and they set up a huge network in Paris called Entre Alliés, uh, which was very successful. And, and uh, Carré used to make no attempts to hide herself. She'd wander around in a red berry and a distinctive fur coat. And these two worked together. They set up a huge organization. 
and for a while it was the only organization that was systematically reporting from France. It got bigger and bigger. The radio traffic coming out of them got more and more dense. And in the end, she was betrayed. <coughs> and she was betrayed to a colonel, uh, to a uh, German sergeant called Hugo Bleicher, who worked for the intelligence, for the Abwehr. And Bleicher was an extremely clever man. He, he was actually a carpet salesman, but he had a devious sort of uh, weird thinking brain. He called himself Colonel Henry, Colonel Henri, and he, he managed to find Mathilde Carré in bed with her boss. He arrested her, and he flung her into a stinking prison in Paris in her fur coat, and she spent the night there sobbing and afraid. And then the next morning, she was, after being screamed at and told she's got to keep her cell clean, she was dragged out, taken to meet um, uh, Bleicher, and instead of being screamed at, they gave her coffee, rolls, butter, treated her very well, was polite to her. And Bleicher came in and said, you're too clever to be executed. He said, I want you to work for me. He said, if you don't work for me, I'll execute you. So she, he, with those words, he turned her and she became a German agent. That day, the day that he turned her, she led him to some agents that she was due to meet and they were arrested and all through the night they began to round up key personnel in the, in the, in the um, network. One of whom was a lady called Madame Ugentobler who had um, been a, what they call a sort of post office. She'd, she'd been helped to transmit information back to London. And when she was arrested she said, what, my ba she just had a little child and she said, my baby, my baby, what's going to happen to my baby? And Bleicher looked at her and said, Madame, France will look after your baby. And that night, Mathilde Car Carey became his mistress, and Madame Hugentobler hanged herself in the prison. So that shows you the, how high the stakes were. It wasn't just spies and all that sort of thing. People died, people committed suicide, people got very um, badly treated. And Bleicher then used uh, Mathilde Carey's radio to transmit to London pretending to be Carey, and London believed that they, that they were listening to the real thing, and hundreds of Allied agents were arrested over the next few weeks. And Mathilde Carey was set up, he called her the Cat, and he set her up in this house with radios that they called the Cattery. And a, uh, uh, at about Christmas, of, I think it's 42, and a senior underground worker became very, very suspicious of Mathilde Carey, and confronted her and said, I think you're a spy and I think you're working for the Germans. And she said, she, no, I'm not. Yes, no, I am. And she, and she broke down and confessed. And, and she was very sort of attractive and beguiling. And she said, well, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. I was under terrible pressure. I had no choice. Uh, I, I really want to work for the, for the British and for the Americans. Please help me. And, they, and it, uh, uh, the, the senior um, resistance worker didn't believe her but he thought, if I can get her back to London, I can help try and break this network. And Bleich, so he went to Bleicher and said, I'd like to take her, we'd like to get her back to London. And Bleicher first of all thought, this is crazy. And then he thought, no, no, this woman could become Matahari. I'd have a spy right in the middle of London. And then the whole thing developed into a sort of carry-on film with the Germans knowing that they were trying to get her back, the British knowing that they were trying to get get her back. There were British t t torpedo boats off the coast of France. There were German p torpedo boats. There were German guards. There were British, British officers landing in France, including Boddington. And everybody had been told, let her go. So it was, you know, I know that you know that I know that I'm not doing it, that you're doing it. And eventually, she got back to London. She was arrested. She was then treated very well for a few, few weeks whilst she was interrogated. And Vera Atkins took her around, took her to the shop called Harvey Nichols in London. They bought her presents. They took her to, to uh, you know, to have wonderful dinners. And all the while, her rooms were, the rooms in the hotel where she, she was living were bugged. And um, when they thought that they got enough from her, and all the while they were also transmitting back, they were playing another, a double game on the Germans. They were transmitting Mathilde Carey's stuff back into France, and now the Germans were believing it. And then when they finally thought, well, we've got everything we know out of her, they arrested her. 
after, about two, week, two months after, after she'd arrived in Britain, and they, put her, they kept her in prison for the rest of the war, and after the war she was condemned to death by the Fre French for treason, and that sentence was eventually commuted. But she'd done immense damage to the whole of the intelligence network and especially to F section and especially to the bit of it that was run by, which, which was all of it, by um, uh, Maurice Buckmaster. And just to give you an idea of how incompetent Maurice Buckmaster was, uh, they needed somebody to organize landings into France. The Royal Air Force was saying it's chaos. We get there with these agents. We try to land them. There's, no age, there's nobody there to meet them. There's nobody to bring, for us to bring back out. And Boddington said, oh, well, there's, there's this man called Dericourt. He's just arrived in England. He's a French test pilot. He's just the job. I think, uh, Colonel Buckmaster, that we should employ him. And Atkins met him and said, um, she said, my heart sank because I thought he wasn't a man I could trust. And MI6 knew about him and said, I don't think we should do this. I don't think we should employ him. And Boddington said, no, he's first rate, first rate man. We should employ him. So Buckmaster said, yes, he's first rate man. We'll employ him. And what they didn't know about him was that Derek Hall was working for the Gestapo, that he was being paid for every agent that he could identify and that if he worked as the air traffic officer in France, he would know every, air, every agent that arrived by Lysander aeroplane. And I'm, these agents were inserted by a little tiny aircraft, and this little badge I'm wearing is to commemorate those aircraft and the pilots who flew the women in. Um, so now we've got, a, we've got a Gestapo agent employed by London working to receive uh, the, the agents who are being landed. And the first, one of the first agents that he, Derek Hoare, got hold of was a woman called Noor Inayat Khan. And Noor Inayat Khan was, a, was uh, the daughter of a Sufi mystic. She was very, very gentle. All she wanted to do with her life was to, to write children's books and, and play music. And, and, a, and an idea of how gently she'd been brought up was that her father used to sing her awake in the morning. She could, she'd been brought up in Paris, so she could speak very good French. She looked Indian, so she didn't fit in very well. And she, her father had told her that she must never lie, so she had a very um, sort of straightforward view of life. That view of life. And that were she to be captured, she wouldn't be able to lie. She'd have to say who she was. And um, her children's books were often about creatures who perform great feats of bravery, ironically, great feats of bravery, and, and endure great suffering. Um, the, the, the organization in Paris, thanks to Carré, the networks running, being run out of Paris had begun to fail, and the, more and more people were being rounded up. And there was a particular shortage of radio operators. And if you don't have a radio operator, it doesn't matter how much intelligence you've got, you're, you're blind and deaf. You can't tell anybody what you've got, and you can't receive any information as to what is wanted. So they speeded Noah Khan's um, training up as a, as a radio operator. Uh, and she was quite good at that. She used to make, they used to call her Bang Away Bertha, because she, she made a lot of noise. They have, they have a little key in those days to tap out Morse code and she used to make a terrific noise at it but she was good at it but a lot of people were worried that she was so innocent and sort of sweet and Vera Atkins said um, talked to her and said no I think she should go Mukbar, and she was also very beautiful somebody said once seen never forgotten one of her fellow trainees said please don't send her but three quarters trained she was parachuted uh, she was landed by airplane into France and met by Derek Hoare. And Derek Hoare then knew that she was in France, knew exactly what she looked like, and had a fair idea of where she was going to. And in her, uh, part of her training, she'd been told, don't, uh, you be very careful to, to file your, your reports. And that, that she'd misunderstood what they meant by file. And all that, what they meant was send them in as soon as you've got them. And she thought that meant that she should write them down in a book. So she wrote all her intelligence in a notebook that she carried around with her. Um, and another example of Buckmaster's um, naivety and incompetence is that when um, 
Noor Inayat Khan made her first transmission, one of the things they had, to, one of the things they, they, they could do if, if they were captured and under duress, they had a thing called a true check that they could leave out and that would mean um, that I am acting under duress. I'm, I'm working with a Gestapo officer standing over me. Don't believe anything that I've said. And one agent had been caught almost as soon as he arrived. It wasn't Khan. He'd left out his true check to say, I'm working under duress. There's, an, there's a Gestapo officer standing by me. And Buckmaster had radioed back, oh, my dear boy, you've left out your true check. Be more careful in future. So he completely ignored that. And he, and he said to Khan, Please don't forget your true check. Well, luckily he said that to her before she was captured. But for a while, Noor was the only agent um, operating in, in uh, Paris. And a lot, of other, a lot of circuits got hold of her and tried to get her to transmit their stuff. The Germans were, had very good um, radio finding equipment. So the longer you're on air, and by long I mean 45 seconds is a long time to be on air. They can triangulate you with their directional, you know, their direction finding equipment. And they slowly worked out where she was. She, she was exhausted. She was traveling around. She disguised herself by dyeing her hair blonde at one point, putting on mad wigs, anything. But eventually she got home one night absolutely shattered and there was a man in her room. She'd been betrayed. Somebody had taken money and this man fought her and she fought him and she, 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 she bit his hand so badly that it was scarred for the rest of his life. But she, was, she fought like a tiger, he said, and they took her back to the Gestapo, head, the Abwehr headquarters in Paris, and the first thing she did was to say, I want to have a bath. She got in the bath, and then she screamed at them that they must shut the door, because the guards left the door open. And so they shut the door, and she then climbed out of the window, which was five floors up, and for a while hung onto this ledge, but she was, she was discovered and dragged back in. She was interrogated, she tried to escape one more time, nearly made it, and then was captured and, 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 and told that she had been classified, or, or they did classify her as what's called a night and fog prisoner. She, and she was, she was described as being incredibly dangerous. She was sent to a concentration camp, she was chained to the floor, she was kept naked, she was beaten. Um, and she was given a terrible time. And if you can imagine how horrible it must have been. I mean, it's horrible for anybody, but if you are a very, very gentle creature, it's doubly, worth, doubly bad. And she, 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 the, the food she was given to eat was slops. And she could, if she was lucky, she got to partially clean herself once a week. And Buckmark, other people said, look, we know Noor Khan's been arrested. There were messages coming in saying, Noor is in hospital, which means she's... She's under arrest. And Buckmaster said, no, no, she's not. She's, um, she's rebuilt the whole network. She's, she's, everything's fine. Don't worry about Noah. She's, she's great. The network is in perfect working order. How he came to think that, I do not know. Um, whilst Noah was suffering, um, there was an agent called Violet Z Violette Zabo, who was French, uh, English French, sort of um, London French. She was sent to France. She worked very successfully. Um, she discovered things about some networks that had s stopped working. She went back to Paris. She had a big float of money with her, and she, she was very poor, and she went to a French couturier and bought herself wonderful clothes for herself and her daughter, and then was taken back to London. And then D-Day occurred, and she was parachuted back in. She was parachuted this time, and her luck ran out, and within days of arriving, she ran into a column called the Das Reich. It's a German inf uh, armored column that had come under attack by the um, resistance, and they captured her and took her to a concentration camp. Virginia Gr Granville, at the same time, had parachuted. She'd gone back to London. She'd been sent back. She'd parachuted onto a plateau in the center of France, into the, straight into the middle of a battle, and she'd helped fight her way off the plateau with her new boss, a charismatic man called Francis Kamertz. And of course, it's, it's, it's um, Christine Granville. By the time they got off the plateau, they were lovers. Um, uh, at, 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 there was, there's another terrible story about three, eight, four agents who had been captured, interrogated, set, and sent to be executed. And this, is a, this, is a, this is a harrowing story. The last thing that was seen of them, and we know a lot about what happened in their last 12 hours, they were taken to...
a concentration camp called Natzweiler, they were dressed in ordinary civilian clothes. One of them had a fur coat on. And people who saw them couldn't work out what was going on. They thought maybe they're going to start a brothel. But they'd had, they, they arrived with orders to be assassinated, to be executed. And that night, the doctors in the camp decided that they would execute them by giving them lethal injections of phenol, a very, very horrible drug, which is sometimes mixed with oil to be used for experiments on children. And that night, they were all injected with this drug, which stunned them and then put it living into the crematoria to be burned. And one of them, as she was put in, scratched the face of the a German who was dealing with her and shouted, Vive la France! And again, he, had a, he, he, he bore the scars of that scratch, those scratches for a long time. Derricourt's luck ran out, ran out, and he was taken, he was ordered back to London, much to um, uh, Buckmaster's annoyance, because he wanted Derricourt to go on being there, and you can imagine the, the damage that Derricourt was doing. On the bravery side, uh, Christine Granville, I mean, there are two stories about her. One is that she was working in the foothills of the, Al the, Spani the, the Italian Alps, and she ran into an Italian um, patrol who said, right, we're arresting you. And she, she had on her a hand grenade, and she, qu she just grabbed the grenade, pulled the pin out, and held the grenade in one hand and the pin in the other and said, right, you can do what you like. She said, you can shoot me or you can arrest me, but whatever you do, unless you go away, I'm going to drop the grenade. And of course, if she dropped the grenade, if a grenade went off in this room, a lot of us would not survive the explosion. And the, the Italian soldiers very wisely withdrew and left Christine on her own. And the other, the other the story, which I think is true, is that she was discovered by a German dog patrol and they had these very, very fierce Alsatian dogs one of the dogs found her sniffing around, snarling, and Christine, could, she could dominate almost any living creature that she came across, and she stroked the dog, and within seconds, the dog had become a French underground resistance worker, and its, and its, and its German master called it, and its little ears pricked up, and its snarling teeth, and it just went and licked Christine's face, and she then took it home, back to her, you know, to her headquarters, and it, it worked, the dog worked and became a resistance dog for the rest of the war. The last thing she did was that the man she'd fallen in love with and two other agents were arrested. And when Christine heard that they'd been arrested, she immediately, and, the, and by now, the war's creeping towards its end. Uh, and, and they're all in the south of France and the Americans have landed in the south of France and are slowly moving up. So Christine went to the prison where she thought they were. She and Francis Kermertz, her, her lover, had a deal that they used to sing a f song called Frankie and Johnny together so there were a lot of people milling around outside the prison and she began to sing Frankie, the song Frankie and Johnny. Frankie and Johnny were lovers and she heard from inside the prison another voice singing the, the same song and she knew that Francis was in there so she went into the prison she blagged her way and I don't know how she did it and she demanded to see the, the, the man running the prison and was interrogated him by him for the next four hours. Now, he could have shot her. He could have organized for her to be taken out, out and shot. He could, he could have just arrested her. He would have done what he wanted with her. But her, her um, powers of persuasion and her personality were so strong that this man who'd started off with a Luger pistol in his hand, wearing his SS uniform, arrogant and haughty, was a, was a gibbering wreck. I mean, his hands were shaking. He couldn't, couldn't pour out a cup of coffee. She said, if you don't release those men, I will see to it that your life is made of misery. You will be arrested by the Americans. You will be shot. You'll be, either, if that doesn't happen, you'll be captured by the um, resistance and they will torture you to death. Re release those men. And he decided that he, he, he would release. He, she so frightened him that he would release them. And that night, they, that um, afternoon, they were all waiting. The three prisoners who, who, who were, 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 that she was trying to get out were told, right, you've come with us. And they thought, this is it. We're going to be executed. They were marched out. They could see the field where the executions took place. There was nobody in it. They were put in a car. And they thought, what's going on? And, and, th and then they were driven away out of the prison with the, with the SS man. And ahead, they saw in the dark and the rain, they saw a white wall with a like a spy film, a figure in a black mac, you know, spy raincoat. 
that got in the car, it was Christine. She turned around and looked at them and didn't speak and they thought, oh, they've arrested, they've arrested, they were so confused, they've arrested Christine. But after another few miles, they, all, they were all ordered out of, out of the car. The Germans took off their uniforms and buried them and they were freed and they were, they were um, uh, you know, re, re, uh, they reunited with the Allies. And somebody has said that that is the single greatest act of bravery a greatest individual act of bravery, a, 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 German, a, a British general said, it's the greatest single act of bravery of the whole war. So that gives you an idea of <coughs> how, what an enormous amount luck played in the hands of these people. If um, Violet Zabo, had she not run into this German column, would have probably acted very, very successfully. But she did, she was arrested she was taken to a concentration camp and she was eventually shot in the head and she was, as, she was even under arrest, she was incredibly brave and, and when she and some other agents were taken in a, in a transport train out of Paris to the camps with loads of other prisoners, the men were, were chained to the floor and to the walls of the things, the women weren't and the, the train came under air, Allied airborne attack and Christine Granville and another woman with her crawled up and down the train giving water to the, to the men who were, pr who were chained prisoners in that, um, in that tr tr train. And it, what's so sad about her is that in the end they broke, they broke her spirit because in, she was put to work wearing the, the summer frock that she'd been arrested in, light shoes. She was put to work in the freezing cold on, in a labor camp sawing up wood, digging up, sawing up wood, very, very hard timber work. And one somebody saw her, saw her towards the end of her life and she said, I'm so cold, I'm so cold. And they had, no, nobody, however brave, can withstand that sort of um, treatment. It's just too violent. But, you know, she's another, she's another one of these people who, I'm running out of time, but she's another one of these people who set a very high standard for us. Some of the women, were told uh, when they were recruited, oh my dear, um, you, you'll, never, um, you, you'll never lead men. Of course, I mean, you'll help them, you'll run a safe house. These same women, once they'd been in France, two or three of them led resistance group, groups of four or 5,000 young, Fre badly tempered Frenchmen. And they managed, 27, 28, 31 year old women managed to dominate them and make them do what they want and were revered by these men and um, for the rest of their lives, the men's lives, they would remember those women who'd parachuted and, and um, uh, come among them. So, you know, you have no leadership qualities. Actually, they had more leadership qualities than any, anybody going. And the, uh, I'm coming to the end, and I'd last like to talk about the sad end, but, the, in it, but also uplifting end of Nur Inayat Khan because after months and months of horrifically bad treatment, <coughs> excuse me, after months and months of horrifically bad treatment, kept in solitary confinement, being told that she had to become like vapor. She'd, we Germans think that you're gonna be, want you to be just like vapor. Nobody will ever know what what happened to you, and people would sometimes hear her sobbing. And the only way she could communicate with people was sometimes she'd r scratch on the tin plate that was her, that she'd get to, f you know, get food on, uh, little messages. And the other, the Germans never t knew this was happening, and the other women in other cells would, t t saw what was happening and, r and scratch messages back. And, and at one time she said, I'm a British agent, I'm, I'm so unhappy. Because of Derricor, she knew that all the letters she'd sent in the secret airplanes to her mother had been read. They showed, they showed them to her. The Germans showed them to her and said, we know exactly what's going on. We've, we know everything about you. And that, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're captured in an enemy environment, that's very, very demoralizing. And in the end, she became one of four women in Dachau uh, who was condemned to death to, towards the end of the war, Hitler decided that all British agents would be executed. And the German officer who was charged with executing her, 
was told, give the Creole the works. And we know what that meant because after the war he was interrogated and he, and he confessed to what had happened. And he spent the night beating her up, raping her. And he said, by the end, he said, by the time I'd finished with her, she was a bloody mess. This gentle Indian princess who only wanted to write children's stories. And then his last act was to hold his revolver, his, his pistol up, to shoot her in the head. And just before he pulled the trigger, she looked at him in all her fear and suffering and said, Liberté, liberty. And then he shot her and she died instantly. She can never have thought that those words would have gone anywhere but bouncing off the walls of her little cell. She must have thought that her life was absolutely in vain. She must have thought it was all a waste, if she thought anything. And yet, 62 years later, last year, I was at, had the privilege of being at London University at the Noor Khan, the inaugural Noor Khan Noor Inayat Khan Liberté Lecture and it was given by an Indian civil rights lawyer called Vrinda Grover, a marvellous woman in her own right and she talked about Noor, she talked about her own work, she talked about the, the importance of, for the individual to stand up for against the forces of oppression, however much you think oh, it's only me, whatever I do cannot help. Noah Khan has shown us that the, every little thing you do does count. You know, there were hundreds of people at this lecture and Noah Khan's, Khan's last words, Liberté, had reverberated down the decades and they're with us all still. So she, for me, epitomizes the value and the importance of these very brave women and, and the brave men who were also SOE agents. But I think because the women were so derided to begin with, they set us a very high moral bar by which we must live. And I'm, I'm, I'm completely out of time now, but I'm, um, I'm going to, before I ask if there are any questions, I'm going to read a poem that was given to Christine Granville as her, uh, her um, code. She could use this poem to, to, to encode and decode messages, and London had the same poem, but it's a real poem, and for me it, um, it sums up what those women sacrificed, because of the 40 who were captured, and of the 40 who were sent to France, 13 were captured and died, several more, I mean, 10 more came back so broken that they could never operate properly. One, one was found two years ago, now an old woman, in a flat in Brighton in England. She'd been dead for, f for something like a fortnight and nobody knew about her and yet she had been very, very brave. And so this poem sums up what they did for me and, and for all of us that they fought for when they were fighting the Germans. The life that I have is all that I have. And the life that I have is yours. The love that I have of the life that I have is yours and yours and yours. A sleep I shall have, a rest I shall have, yet death will be but a pause. For the peace of my years in the long green grass will be yours, and yours, and yours. And that for me, that's the spirit of those brave women. Thank you. <laughs> the, thank you very much indeed. I hope um, what I've given you is a, is a very, very shortened version of what happened. There are, there are many more stories that there are, just haven't been the time to, to tell, but all those stories add up to one glowing ball of sort of moral good. Now, d does anybody have any questions? Right here, right here. Yes. Um, Sir. That's really interesting, and, and heroism, heroism is amazing, 
Um, but I was wondering, what, wh how effective was the resistance in France at the at destroying the German supply lines, and did they go into other countries and help other resistant groups? And the, um, the answer is it's very, very difficult to answer that question because the, what the, the main sort of achievement of the resistance was to accumulate knowledge and data and in intelligence prior to D-Day, which was of some but not a huge amount of help to the Allies. The, the, the um, armored division that got hold of um, Christine Granville had become under attack by the resistance. There is no way that people armed with Bren guns can stop an armored division. To stop an armored division, you have to um, have airplanes or another armored division. And somebody wrote, Max Hastings wrote, well, they, they disrupted their time. It took them nine days to get to Normandy. Well, you try moving tanks right across France. It, that was, to get them there in nine days was a brilliant piece of, of staff work. So in, in terms of actually what they did physically, they did blow up things, they did do this, that, and the other. They were often reprisals. It's very difficult to know that they did it that much good. But in all the countries they worked in, they, they were a terrific uh, help to morale, and they helped people who lived in the darkness, who nobody knew the Germans were going to lose. I mean, right up to, 19, right up to after D-Day, there was no, no the, we, people thought, well, we, we could lose, we could lose, the Allies could lose. And the fact that the resistance were doing things made a huge difference to morale and kept people going. And I, I wrote a, um, a book about the capture of a German general on Crete. And there were terrible reprisals up to the, uh, after that. But the Cretans still say, the next day when we heard about this, we all walked a foot taller. And, you know, it just kept you going. It kept them going through the darkness. So I think that if you had the choice of whether you, if you, if you could wind back time and go into it again, you, I think you would say, well, you know, one person is not very much. If you compare that to the cost of a landing craft full of trained soldiers, whatever damage one person can do in the terrible butcher's bill of war, it's probably worth it. So I think they didn't do a lot. They didn't do as much as we think romantically, physically, but I think in terms of morale, they did a huge amount. No, I'm fine. Yeah, no thanks. Um, any any other question? No. It's all oh, right. There must have been so many women that you wanted to include, or stories that you wanted to include, but didn't fit, or you couldn't quite substantiate. Are there are there areas that you wish you could have? In brought into the book, or oh. people? Oh, yes. I mean, every, you, could, you could write a book on its own about every single one of them. And Shrabani Bashu did write about Noor Khan, a, a, a whole book that describes everything she did and her life in complete detail. I knew that I couldn't really handle more than um, six or seven, because I just couldn't fit them in. The stories would become too fragmented. So I stole, I, I chose the six or seven who had more or less coherent stories working together. And whilst every element of the book is footnoted, researched, footnoted, or footnotable, I tried to write it as though it was a novel. I tried to write it with the excitement of a novel. So if I wrote Noah Khan was very unhappy that morning, I've got to have some other piece of evidence. Somebody has written about her being unhappy that morning, or she said I was unhappy that morning. She said to somebody, Ev everything in the book is, um, True, and what, what, what I also did was I tried to tell it in strict chronology so that, you, so that you, you, you never knew what was going to happen next. Um, and the very, very interesting thing that that did was it, that it threw up how completely incompetent and untrustworthy the leadership of the SOE F section was. I mean, they, it, they were on a vertical learning curve. They didn't know particularly Buckmaster, you know, if you, once you've hired a Gestapo agent to work for you, you've made a pretty big mistake. And I know somebody who worked with Buckmaster in advertising after the war. Buckmaster ran the advertising of some sort of authority, and, and he said he was so bad at it that we had to get rid of him in the end. I mean, they should have, there is an argument that they should have been run by the military, but 
Yeah, I mean, I'd like to have written about all of them, but the book would have been intolerably long and the stories would have been too disparate. And I, I mean, when I was write, starting to write, I did, a ti I did an Excel timeline of every week of the war and, the, and I had the stories originally of 100 people who were more or less involved. And, and some of the elements of the timeline were day long and, and, it, and in Noah Khan's um, case, the timeline came down to an hour by hour analysis of her life just before she was captured and this I couldn't possibly print it out I could just sort of scan it on my computer it was too complex so I simplified it and, and went for the six who made the most coherent tale but that's not because of any reason other than I couldn't just couldn't write about 40 people thanks there's a there's a gentleman here and Uh, namaste, sir. Uh, this happens to be a very juvenile question post your... Am I audible? This happens to be a very juvenile question post your amazing words, but I want to ask that the people you have written about happen to be uh, women, plus they are from the intelligence, uh, the work of intelligence department. So how extensive and reliable your research was, because this happens to be a biographical work, sort of biographical work for the uh, people who are engaged in intelligence services? I mean, the, what is... N a, 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 the, the, I had two sorts of sources. Oh, so just one adder. Oh, right. that, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry. Sorry, sorry. No, I'm uh, sorry. That uh, often you uh, uh, said the exact words that might have been spoken by them that when she died, she, she said the word liberty. So yes. such words are very inspiring and moving. but. I happened to uh, examine how reliable such, uh, such things which uh, come into the or biographical work is. Well, if the man Thanks. who had shot her said that she said liberté and describes what he did in that terrible last night, I, on the whole, I believe him. And he wasn't just, you know, he was interrogated by the Allies, he was interrogated by French officers. I, th I think that, what the, 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 that that is reliably true. Um, the most valuable source of material was uh, contained in the National Archive in England where all the surviving SOE files are and those files contain quite detailed um, reports on what the women were doing. I mean, for instance, there's one called Nancy Wake who was a rip-roaring Australian and one of the reports says um, she led us like a man and, and describes in detail the battle at which she led them like a man. The other a very important source of material was the National Archive in the American National Archive in Washington. And I was also able, to, I made contact with a sometime intelligence officer who'd written a D. Phil thesis on the SOE, an ex soldier called Steve Kipax, and he ha has made it his life's work to scan and get hold of all the existing documentation, a lot of which has never been read. And, and I got all of that from him. He was very helpful. He was quite broke when I met him, so I paid him. It was a privilege to pay him, and and worked through the worked through all the scans, and and was able th through doing it chronologically to piece together a, a true story of what happened. I mean, and sometimes I'd get a snip. You know, when um, Noor was arrested, I could work out with a map of Paris an understanding of the places where we knew she was, how she'd got from A to B, and where the people chasing her must have gone. So I think I can put my hand on my heart and say that this is a, a very, very accurate, truthful book. And, and also, I don't, I d it, it would demean the, the um, memory of these women to, to make it up. I didn't want to make it up. And the more I went into it, the more, the braver and the more admiration I had for them. Does that answer your question, sir? Was there somebody over there? Yeah. Oh, it was Victor. Senor. Um, do you think it's true that women made um, better agents and, and, and were braver? And if, and if true, and if it's so, why, what qualities, why? What qualities I mean, do they have that men don't? I think that what, the, I th what, what Selwyn Jepson said, and I think, I think this is true, he said that women are very, very good at working on their own. And they, they, don't, they don't, we, we blokes, we, we, we like belonging to clubs, we like being with other men. Men tend to like teamwork and they go on and on about, all respect to teamwork, 
Um, they go on and on about being together. And if you isolate them, it's quite easy to sort of break them. And, that, and there are many examples of that happening. Not all the time, but the women, um, I, I think, were more resilient. And, and like Noah Khan, nothing in Noah Khan's life <coughs> had prepared her <coughs> sorry, for what happened. And yet, from the depths of her gentle being, she summoned up enormous courage, you know, resources of courage. So I think, yes, they are, this is not to say that men aren't brave. Men are brave, but they, the women are, I think, as, as if not more brave when the chips are down. And luckily, most of us, for most of us, the chips never are down. I think there's time for one more question, that, if there is one. No, that, that's it. Well, that, it, the, the, the thing's now counting down the last six, 60 seconds. So I hope I've given you a sort of a, a feel for how these um, women were and felt how important their lives were, are for us. And um, thank you very much indeed for listening and coming. Thank you. Thank you.